This movie covers IBESS subtopic 5.2, Terrestrial Food Production Systems and Food Choices, under the main IBSS topic 5, Soil Systems and Society. There are over 7 billion people over the world that seek daily to nourish themselves. How people eat varies greatly by region and for different reasons, and the quality of their nourishment also varies greatly. Malnutrition is an umbrella term for bad nutrition. It can include undernourishment or the lack of calories. It can, it can mean excessive nourishment or too many calories, and it can mean unbalanced nutrition or a diet that contains enough energy but lacks essential nutrients. Billions of people are excessively nourished while millions of people are undernourished. Of the undernourished population, 98% of them live in low income areas. 10% of the undernourished die each year, most of them being children under the age of five. 30% of the world's population lacks a balanced diet. The question is, how can we justify about one-sixth of the world's population, 13%, not having enough food when there are apparently large surpluses in more economically developed countries? And what determines what food choice is grown in these different areas? What determines food choice? Well, climate and ecological conditions will determine what will grow. Humans adapt through irrigation and greenhouses to alter officially climate, but most crops grow without this. Cultural and religious influences. Some religions prescribe certain foods like Islam and Judaism don't eat pork and Hindus don't eat beef. Traditions determine what foods we prefer. Political influences. Governments subsidize or put tariffs on some food to encourage or discourage production of certain foods. Socioeconomic influences. Market for forces determine supply and demand in a free market economy. For example, a short supply of almonds or beans will result in higher prices, but if supply increases, by more farmers growing the crops, then the prices fall and farmers stop growing it. But we all need food to survive. So let's look at food production around the world. Significant idea number one for this subtopic, the sustainability of terrestrial food production systems is influenced by sociopolitical, economic, and ecological factors. The sustainability of terrestrial food production systems is influenced by factors such as scale, industrialization, mechanization, fossil fuel use, seed crop livestock choices, water use, fertilizers, pest control, pollinators, antibiotics, legislation, and levels of commercial versus subsistence food production. Different types of farming systems include intensive farming, small scale, and high input. These practices include growing high yield crops using fertilizers and pesticides and keeping animals indoors. Food production increases, but there are unwelcome side effects. Extensive large scale or low input agricultural uses small inputs of labor, fertilizers, and capital relative to the area of land being farmed. Nomadic herding is an example of extreme extensive farming where herders move their animals to use feed from occasional rainfalls. Pastoral farming is that of animals, why arable farming is that of crops. There are also food production systems that mix pastoral and arable farming. I'm going to focus now on commercial and subsistence farming practices. Commercial agriculture is large-scale production of crops for sale, intended for widespread distribution to wholesalers or retail outlets. In commercial farming, crops such as wheat, mice, tea, 
coffee, sugarcane, cashew, rubber, banana, cotton are harvested and sold in world markets. Pictured here is a sugarcane field. In subsistence farming, nearly all of the crops or livestock are raised in order to be used to maintain the farmer and the farmer's family, leaving little, if any, surplus for sale or trade. If a farmer is able to sell some of his product, this is called cash cropping. This is an image of subsistence farming of pearl millet in Nambia, Africa. Pearl millet is used as a whole grain like rice cracked or as a flour in pasta in fermented foods, porridges, kukas, beverages, and snacks. Commercial. Large-scale farming tends to rely heavily on machinery, chemicals, and extensive use of fossil fuels. Subsistence farming is small scale, which tends to be more labor intensive, but still might rely on chemicals to boost production if they can afford it. Industrialization drives commercial farming. More economically developed countries have many people working in industry, and so they must be provided with food from large scale commercial farming. However, lower economically developed countries have limited industry, so job opportunities are limited and people may have to grow their own food and rely on subsistence farming. As mentioned, commercial large-scale farming tends to rely on machinery. It uses a lot of heavy machinery, which can damage the soil, and it uses fossil fuels. However, Subsistence farming uses draft animals like donkeys or oxen or human power, which is less stressful on the soil and can add manure to fertilize the soil. Draft animals are powered by plants, so there is no burning of fossil fuels. Commercial farming uses a heavy dependence of fossil fuels, which is using finite resources and produces large amounts of pollution. Whereas in subsistence farming, the use of manual labor or draft animals does not cause the problems that fossil fuel use does. Commercial farming systems sometimes grow crops or keep animals that are not indigenous to the area, and this can create the need for irrigation, glass houses, imports, and imports of feedstuffs. However, in subsistence farming, selecting organisms that are indigenous is less likely to create the problems that additional maintenance requires, such as irrigation glass houses and importing food for the animals. Some agricultural systems have very heavy water demands and require large scale irrigation solutions, which can divert water from people and may cause localized water supply problems and a drop in the water table. But subsistence farming also requires water for irrigation, and it also can be used unsustainably. In commercial farming, when farmers produce the same crop continuously on the same plot of land, this requires chemicals to support the soil. While subsistence farmers tend to practice crop rotation and biological pest control, these causing fewer problems as compared to the commercial farming. But many subsistence farmers will use large amounts of pesticides or in this case fertilizers if they can afford it. In commercial farming, keeping animals in close quarters, often inside, causes the spread of diseases and this requires large amounts of antibiotics, often used routinely. If these make it into the local ecosystem, they can cause superbugs. On subsistence farms, animals typically run free. Free-range animals tend to be healthier and in less need of antibiotics. Large-scale commercial interests are controlled by legislation and so may pollute less, while small-scale operations often go unnoticed by legal bodies, so their practices can't be monitored and certain practices can't be enforced. Many commercial crops, like these almond trees in California require pollination by bees and other insects, 
That's what these boxes are, beehives. Honey beehives are brought in to provide this pollination, but honeybee collapse disorder is killing many bees. And so some crops have no pollinators left and humans have to do this by hand. But in a subsistence farm, there is more biodiversity. And so pollinators have different habitats and there are usually enough insects to pollinate the crops, right? Because each of these rows requires different pollinators and not so many of them. As I've mentioned, there is enough food and food production has kept up with the world population. However, we do keep growing. Therefore, we are using more land and we degrade more land. We demand more meat. We are reaching limits of growth. Remember, socioeconomic, cultural, ecological, political, and economic factors can be seen to influence choice of food production systems. Countries with low food supplies are called low income food deficient countries and become reliant on other countries for their food. If countries rely on other countries for food, they are under the power of those countries. They are, there are political influences at play. And what are the impacts of corrupt governments that don't distribute food to those in need? And what political powers decide who needs food? Now let's talk about food production systems. But first, we need to cover some basics. So here is a quick summary of what is involved in growing crops. First, you have to clear the land. Again, this can be done with machines or manually. Second, you need to condition the soil by breaking it up and plowing it or digging it over. This is called cultivating the soil. Third, you need to plant the seeds. Again, whether with machines or by hand. Fourth, you help your crops to grow by treating for weeds and or pests. And you also might add fertilizer. Finally, the harvest can be done. The actual removal of the biomass from the field, the soil, and this ecosystem. That's what the harvest is. When you remove the biomass from the field, the nutrients go with it. Thus, the fertility of the soil would decrease over time. To address this issue, crop rotation is practiced. A farmer divides up his land and plans a series of planting, including cover crops like leguminous plants, soya beans, peas, peas and beans, to add nitrogen to the soil at least every four years. In this example, plot one, would have a different series of crops during the year. But the following year, it would have a different series of crop. And plot two might have this series of plantation. In livestock farming, animals need to feed, preferably with plant material unsuitable for human digestion systems, like grass, or in this example, creosote and mesquite bushes. The plant material is then converted to valued protein. Pigs can be used to consume waste products and converted them into protein. The problem is that commercial farming of livestock often involves generating feed for the animals, as well as possibly needing to treat them with antibiotics. Some farmers additionally treat them with hormones to increase the amount of protein per animal. The yield of food per unit area from lower trophic levels is greater in quantity. Remember the second law of thermodynamics. It is also lower in cost and may require fewer resources. Inputs to terrestrial food production include manual labor, hand tools, machines, technology, fertilizers, pesticides, fuel, packaging, and transportation. Outputs of terrestrial food production include the amount of food, is it enough to feed the family or does it have high yields per hectare or low yields per hectare? There is data on the efficiency of different terrestrial food production systems. Efficiency involves calculating the energy it takes to produce the food and deliver it to the market and the yield of the food. It includes the labor and fuel all along the production processes and the energy used to prepare the soil, sow the seed, harvest the crop, prepare and appropriately package it for the market, transport it to the market, and the cost of dealing with waste products. This image compares the efficiency of different terrestrial food production systems in the terms of K K 
kilocalories of fossil fuel input per kilocal of protein output. Of course, the efficiency of producing vegetables is the highest with the lowest input per output. What is the difference between these two food production systems? Think of the inputs of feeding cattle versus allowing them to eat freely on a range. You need to be able to discuss how culture choices may influence societies to harvest food from higher trophic levels. For example, culturally, we have developed a taste for tuna and as such eat from high trophic levels. Take a look at this illustration of the efficiency of aquatic food production systems. Notice what types of aquatic food are most efficient. Let's compare terrestrial and aquatic food production systems. Terrestrial, it's food harvested from low trophic levels, like cows, pigs, and chickens. They're all herbivores. It is more efficient fixing of solar energy by photosynthesis and more efficient use of that solar energy. However, there are higher losses regarding waste as compared to aquatic food production systems. In aquaculture, food is harvested from higher trophic levels, mostly because of human taste. Again, recall your knowledge of the second law of thermodynamics and why this is a problem. And though energy conversions are more efficient along the aquatic food chain, the initial intake of solar energy is less efficient and heat losses are greater in water than on land. Here is a reminder why it's less efficient to eat from higher trophic levels. As you move up the trophic level, more of the original energy is lost to heat during respiration. Don't forget the second law of thermodynamics. You need to be able to analyze tables and graphs that illustrate the differences in inputs and outputs associated with food production systems. For example, this chart that illustrates the environmental pressures produced by various food production systems. Can you see that animal production systems produce the most greenhouse gas emissions? Stop the movie and study this diagram to make sure you understand what it's telling you. You need to be able to compare and contrast the inputs, outputs, and system characteristics for two named food production systems, including the location and to evaluate the relative environmental impacts of two named food production systems. In my classes, you've completed a case study on named food production system and have compared it with another. Make sure you can make this comparison with a named food production system, including their location. Here is a brief example of canola versus palm oil production of biodiesel in Brazil. Look at all the inputs and final output of production of biodiesel in both canola and palm oil. Palm oil provides more output efficiency than canola, but at what additional cost? Both canola and palm oil production in Brazil come at the cost of deforestation of the Amazon. That is a huge environmental impact. Look. All of this used to be Amazon. However, canola uses less land than palm oil. So does that make it more sustainable? You need to be able to discuss the links that exist between sociocultural systems and food production systems. One example is the kin ethnic farmers of Vietnam. They are experts in the cultivation of wet rice in level well-watered delta areas. When they migrated to the mountains, they continued the same agricultural practices they had used in the lowlands, which resulted in degradation of the environment. These are rice fields in the mountains of Vietnam. Using the shifting cultivation methods of the mountainous people requires much traditional experience, but is associated with settlement patterns, ways of life, social institution, and rights that are completely alien to the kin people. Thus, they simply continued with their, their traditional agricultural practices. Furthermore, the kin considered the farming methods of the mountain minorities as backward. 
Additionally, the kin have strong traditional cultural preference for rice as their staple food. Therefore, they have concentrated their efforts on increasing rice yield and opening new areas for planting wet rice in the mountains. The food plants of the mountain areas, such as mice and cassava, are, are felt to have lower value and are used by the kin only as food for domestic animals or are consumed in periods of food scarcity when rice is lacking. The kin also have not been interested in planting fruit, fruit trees despite their suitability in the mountains. Again, this is an example of how sociocultural systems can influence food production systems. You need to be able to evaluate the strategies to increase sustainability in terrestrial food production systems. First of all, realize that the factors that contribute to decrease in agricultural land include soil erosion, salinization, desertification, and urbanization. Generally speaking, increased sustainability may be achieved by altering human activity to reduce meat consumption and increase consumption of organically grown, locally produced terrestrial food products, improving the accuracy of food labels to assist consumers in making informed choices, monitoring and control by government and intergovernmental bodies, multinational and national food corporation standards and practices, planting of buffer zones around suitable land for food production to absorb nutrient runoff. Now let's evaluate some specific strategies. We can maximize yield through the improvement of technology. One method is with mixed cropping and intercropping. Mixed cropping is two independent crops mixed together and grown in an area, while intercropping has two or more crops grown in proximity with each other. These techniques conserve water and soil, but they can be costly and complicated. Another method of improved technology is the no-plow tillage, which involves drilling seeds into the stubble of the previous crop. Advantage of this technology is that it conserves water and soil and it reduces energy inputs, right? You don't have to do the extra farming of plowing the field like this. It also reduces um, erosion due to the residue that remains on the top of the soil. However, disadvantages include that there can be disease carryover from previous crops. Weed control is difficult and the benefits of this practice take time to see. Another method of improved technology is to plant buffer zones around agricultural land. You can see the forest buffer zones in this picture. Advantages are that buffer zones absorb nutrient runoff and create habitat for wildlife. However, some farmers might oppose the loose loss of the land of not being able to farm all the way to the edge of their property. Another method of improved technology is biological control of pests. For example, the use of parasitic wasps against aphids pictured here. Advantages include the fact that this is a st specific strategy toward specific pests. The introduced organisms can sustain themselves and it's cost effective. However, it's biology, so it can be fickle and not work exactly as expected. It is also a slow responding treatment. And because the organisms are dependent on the pest for survival, they don't actually eradicate the pest. They only reduce its presence. Think predator-prey relationships. Another technological improvement is the use of trickle drip irrigation. Advantages include less water usage, less leaching, less weeds because they don't have access to the water, and high yield. However, it does have a high initial cost and the system can clog if the water isn't filtered and it requires technical know-how. We can maximize yield by altering what we grow. Genetically modified foods can produce crops that are resistant to insects, tolerant to herbicides, tolerant to heat, cold, or drought, and able to increase crop yield. However, there are, is controversy regarding GMOs, and some regions of the world, particularly the EU, have international regulations restricting the import of GMOs. 
We can also alter what we grow through the use of aquaculture and hydroponics, or a combination of the two into aquaponics. These systems require no soil, they have no weeds or pests, and they decrease the time of growth, thus increasing yield. However, they do have high initial cost and require technical knowledge. A new green revolution, agroecology, incorporates a number of agricultural approaches, including the diversification of crops, the conservation of soil, no tillage planting, green manures, natural fertilizers, biological pest control, rainwater harvesting, and it emphasizes the importance of local knowledge, farmer empowerment, and socioeconomic regulations. Another method of increasing the sustainability of agriculture is to reduce food waste. First, you need to understand something about food waste. Food waste is prevalent in both lower economically developed countries and more economically de developed countries, but for different reasons. In lower economically developed countries, food is lost in production and storage due to pest infestation, severe weather, lack of good storage, no refrigeration, and no canning factories nearby. Bags like these in Tanzania are used to transport many types of produce from mangoes to cabbage across bumpy roads. They are packed as tightly as possible because transporters charge by the unit, not by the weight, and there is little effort to ensure quality of freshness. In more economically developed countries, the loss is in consumption. Consumers buy more food than is needed, and supermarkets have two strict standards, like that apples need to be perfectly round or strawberries need to be bright red. And so food is thrown out, perfectly good food is thrown out. So what can you do to reduce food waste? Here are a few ideas, but there are many, many more. You can start by shopping smart. Buy only the food that you need and store the food in correct manners to prevent premature ripening or rot. Learn to preserve your food through pickling, drying, canning, or freezing. And don't be a perfectionist. Stop rummaging through the apple bin for that perfect apple. Stop demanding flawless produce. Also, Save your leftovers. Eat the skins of fruits and vegetables. Compost and pack your lunch. Another strategy for increasing sustainability of terrestrial food production systems is through monitoring and control. Governmental organizations and intergovernmental organizations can regulate imports and exports to reduce unsustainable agriculture. Multinational and national food corporations can raise standards and practices on their supplier farms. Here is a list of countries that have explicit national policies on supporting sustainable agriculture. Of course, we can change our attitudes towards food and our diets to increase sustainability of terrestrial food production systems. We can eat different crops. We can eat less meat. We can improve education about food. And how about this? We can increase our consumption of insects, which is a big protein source that reproduces rapidly and in large numbers. Yum, yum, yum. Consider the pros and cons of organic farming, right? It supports healthy soil. It's more nutritious and flavorful, supports pollinators. It's a healthier working environment for farmers. It has resistance to pests and diseases. Fertilizers are created on site. There's an opportunity for specializing. It's climate friendly, and it takes future generations into account. However, there aren't subsidies for these farmers. It lacks special infrastructure. It, there is still a use of organic pesticides and fungicides. It's more labor intensive. You require more observation, more knowledge. There are marketing challenges, and there's an arduous certification process. And there are higher costs at the beginning. And the reality is that if we all ate organic food, we would not produce enough. Consumers have a role to play 
through their support of different terrestrial food production systems. A Boston Consulting Group survey of 9,000 consumers in nine countries found that most, 86%, want products that are good for the world and for themselves. Items that are labeled as organic, natural, ecological, or for fair trade are valued. If we insist on these type of products, we can drive more sustainable food production systems by our choices. Significant idea number three for this subtopic is that the supply of food is inequitably available and land suitable for food production is unevenly distributed and this can lead to conflict and concern. We saw this graph earlier in this presentation which illustrates that inequalities exist in food production and distribution around the world. So what are some predictions on food supply for 2030 and beyond? The 2018 Food and Agricultural Organization of the United States report on the future of food supplies projects an increased use of land for crops as seen by the yellow part of the graph. While this graph anticipates a growth in food supplies, as human population grows, along with urbanization and degradation of soil resources, the availability of land for food production per capita decreases. According to the same 2018 FAO report, meat consumption will increase as well as general, general calorie intake, indicating that human population will be increasingly well fed. Not only will the consumption of meat and dairy increase, but an extra billion tons of cereals will need to be grown. A few additional projections include the fact that GMO crops, no tillage planting, soil conservation measures, improved pest control, and aquaculture will all increase and will see, therefore, increasing productivity. Here is a very brief summary of this subtopic. And this ends the movie for IBESS Topic 5.2, Terrestrial Food Production Systems and Food Choices, under the main topic of IBESS Topic 5, Soil Systems and Society. The slides were created by me, Dr. Nina Markham. Image sources are indicated with an URL under the image. If all images on a slide are from the same source, the source is simply cited at the bottom of the slide. Another resource for you is your IBESS textbook, whether in hardback form or online, such as Cognity. Thanks. You for listening.